So welcome back to this festive next level sim gaming video and in this episode we'll be taking a look at both this, the Intel Core Ultra 9285K, Intel's flagship offering and the Asus Z890 ROG Strix motherboard. Now I know what you're thinking. So here's a subjective view on why I'm sticking with Team Blue. And no, it's not because I'm an Intel fanboy. Oh, all right, maybe just a bit, but there's a lot more to this processor than meets the eye. So let's dive in and take a look right after this short message from KeysFan, this video sponsor. Head over to keysfan.com and grab yourself some amazing deals today. Keysfan are higher risks on Trustpilot. Check out the reviews at trustpilot.com. So whether you've built yourself a new gaming PC or whether you're upgrading your existing PC, this Windows 11 Professional Key can be purchased for just over $14 or in UK pounds for just over £11. The keys are simple to purchase within a couple of clicks and emailed to you directly to your email account and available on screen for you to apply. So don't forget to check out the links in the video description and get some amazing deals on product keys because what's best to get your gaming PC ready for those next level sim games than upgrading your operating system and taking advantage of these amazing deals. So Intel have certainly changed direction to a more balanced approach with the Arrow Lake processors, but then again they had to. The issues with the Raptor Lake series were a mistake that Intel couldn't afford to repeat and will undoubtedly not only haunt them but will hurt shareholder confidence for a number of years to come. The CEO Pat Gelsinger was informed he could either retire or face removal. Now, new processor launches are frequently problematic and many choose to wait to let the problems iron out before deciding to early adopt, especially when the price of early adoption offers little or no performance benefit but rarely is there a regression in performance. The Core Ultra series has been rebuilt from the ground up. Much of that reason is necessity to focus on the power efficiency, but for Intel the departure has been much more dramatic, especially given the removal of hyperthreading, a feature that has been near present for all of Intel's historical range. So why have I taken the decision to change from what is at the moment a processor that's performing better in a tuned state, the 4900K, to take a gamble on what other content creators are screaming about its failures? Well, cast your mind back to the i9 4900K, for example, which was only released in October 2023, just over a year prior to the Core Ultra 200S series, and it too had numerous issues, many of which we're still dealing with today, and many of which I'm still dealing with in many of my videos. Through ineffective power efficiency leading to premature degradation and performance issues as well. So I've had the Intel 285K and the ROG Strix Z890 motherboard installed in my PC for just under a week now and unfortunately it's that time of year where the day job takes precedence and I haven't had much time to test or play or even create new videos at the moment. However, initial testing shows that there is certainly, in my view, no significant drop in performance. A lot of the benchmark videos are floating around on YouTube from other content creators focused purely on 1080p gaming and the reason for that is that obviously 1080p is the resolution required to take the workload from a GPU and put it onto the CPU and then obviously we then would assess the FPS as a measure in terms of assessing the performance of a processor. Now, for me personally, I don't believe that's an accurate measure because I don't believe that there are many people out there probably gaming at 1080p. It's probably 1440p or above. The workload probably does shift onto the GPU largely. I have a 4090 installed and I'm going to put the um, actual latest PC specification on screen in a moment to show you where it's at. Um, the memory speed at the moment on there is uh, at the DDR5 Corsair Dominator Titanium running at 7200 mega transfers. However, one exciting feature of the Intel Core Ultra series is that the memory controller is now a separate entity and can entertain speeds with well in excess of 10,000 mega transfers. Now that will then lower latency and in turn obviously then improve performance. So many content creators you'll probably see have said at this moment in time it's perhaps not the time to adopt to it yet or now is not the time or Intel is not the gaming chip that you require or want at the moment. 
that's not saying that it's going to become much better and i believe that my money has bet quite largely on the fact that it will become much better and obviously will be well established in terms of also becoming the gaming cpu that many want it to be uh, obviously remember the days of early ddr5 adoption and we remember the days of the fact that we had issues with ddr5 and getting stability with ddr5 uh, I've been looking at various different threads on various different overclocking forums I'm a member of and there's a lot of excitement around in 285k and certainly even in the 3D Mac community I'm seeing some very good scores starting to come through uh, on faster memory speeds especially with the CU DIMM which isn't widely available I'm actually hanging around till January February to try and pick up a kit of around 9000 plus mega transfers I'm going to do some comparisons with the standard DDR5 7200 mega transfers kit versus that, that I've got and I'm pretty sure that the performance improvements will be quite significant with that in place. Now I don't like to give information before thoroughly exploring the features and issues so it's only been six days of getting to know the processor and I've tested a few scenarios including the Asus AI overclocking feature. Dim Flex is activated within not only this but also the Intel default stream profile. And interestingly, the Intel default settings no longer suppress the performance as we have seen on the i9 14900K, but actually works very well on the Core Ultra 9. So let's have a brief overview of the Z890 BIOS and see what's changed. So we're going to have a brief overview of the Z890 motherboard, and this is the latest BIOS C1101. Now we're going to look at the Intel performance profile and the Intel Extreme profile. So in this instance, you've got the utilized Intel Extreme profile as per the previous videos on the Z790 series. There's a few differences, however. So first of all, you can see we've got the AI overclock tuner set at the XMP tweaks, which is what I would use normally. And then we have a neural processing unit boost facility, which has three different options. It's currently set as automatic on the Intel Extreme profile. So the Asus multi-core enhancements are set to auto. There are different levels on there as per previously. We have the disabled enforce all limits and then the enabled remove all limits and then one at 90 degrees. Now we also have this feature which is called dim flex. Now this is quite interesting because it actually addresses stability issues caused by DDR5 memory by temperature sensitivity. So onto the next page which is the AI tweaker and you can see that the word line calibration is set at four which is normally the overclock level. And you can see here that we have Sync ACDC load line with VRM load line, which is set as enabled, it's normally disabled. Into the AI tweaker, so the power limits for the extreme profile on this chip are 400 amps and 250 watts on both short and long term power duration. And then we have the timing durations which are both set at 56 seconds for both short and long term. Into AI tweaker it gives us some interesting information here on the AI features, so it's showing you obviously what levels things are set at. So this is another interesting specific use case scenario. So as you can see here, I have a Samsung Odyssey G9, which is a 5120x1440 widescreen monitor. And I've just recently obtained a 4K monitor, which acts as the top right for rendering and testing purposes. You can see here it's highlighted as number four on here. There's an Elgato prompter, which is also attached on the top right as well there. And I also have a, another monitor, which is number two on the display here, which is basically in use for uh, screen capture of BIOS etc uh, with a uh, cloner alliance box attached so there's quite a lot going on here now with the Pimax crystal light attached it was causing an issue where basically the bandwidth was basically being taken up by the satellite monitors so I was having to either remove physically the connection to that monitor so it basically removed it from the actually advanced display settings and it was also becoming a bit of an annoyance now you've probably seen this the new Intel graphics cards one of the interesting features of the actual processor is it actually has the Arc GPU display built into it. So I explored the fact of whether I could connect via the display port the actual 4K monitor to that to remove the bandwidth limitations from the actual 4090. And it's worked tremendously well and it's actually improved massively as well with the performance of a Pimax Crystal Light. So it's another added bonus of something that essentially is a feature that's free within the, the 285K. Something that I was actually initially looking at deactivate and however it's something that may be worth considering if you're having multi-monitor setups and obviously having sim racing scenarios where you may want to add an additional monitor or you have a vr headset and you want to take some of that bandwidth off your main gpu so the actual control center is actually very good as you can see here as well 
Now I'm not going to get into benchmarking at this stage. Uh, this is something that we'll look at in the future video, but the initial use in rendering has had no issues. And the first pass on R23, after applying the Intel defaults its stream profile, produces a score of over 42,000, which is very encouraging. And I look forward to some future testing of the processor in the new year. So, as is often the case with early adoption of new architecture, we will have to wait for the supporting hardware and BIOS updates with microcode updates and even Windows scheduling improvements to get the very best from this processor, I believe. I have been approached by SK Hynix to test some of their new memory kits and 5th generation NVMe drives in January, so it'll be interesting to see how this improves on memory scheduling and consequential latency which is a factor that appears to be holding back on the benchmark and on the gaming benchmarks at least. Now, should you run out and buy one of these? Again, this depends on your use case, and for me personally, there have already been some benefits to having this processor in terms of rendering stability, which was something in particular that I had issues with previously. Now, there is no need to undervolt, as the processor runs incredibly cool during both gaming and productivity so far anyway. I have done some small tests with some low undervolts, but it isn't receptive to any games from this due to the high levels of efficiency already in place. It will certainly be an interesting future for these new processors. I am also sure of that given the fact that you will see Core Ultra series appear in a lot of the new pre-builds and system integrator builds in 2025. As always, thank you for watching, have a fantastic Christmas and New Year, and if you haven't already, I would really appreciate a like, subscribe and share. It costs nothing, but it helps me bring you new content absolutely free. And until next time, take care, and I'll see you again in the next video.